we're going to talk about recursive, recursively defined uh, sequences. So we looked at a sequence where if you know what n is, you could just tell me the nth term. We had a formula, you know n, you can get the nth term. So that was nice. You didn't, if I asked you for the thousandth term, you didn't have to compute the 999 that come before it. So recursive means it's defined on things that, at least mathematically, recursive means it's defined on things that came before it. So if we go recursive sequence, we have a n is going to equal uh, some formula with uh, probably best to give an example. So we'll just start with an example. A n is equal to a n minus 1 plus a n minus 2. So what does this mean? The nth term is the sum of the two terms that came before it. So do we have any hardcore nerds who know what sequence this makes? You can impress us with your knowledge. All right, maybe when we start writing out some terms. Now you have a little problem with this recursive sequence that you need to know what some of the beginning terms are. So you need to know, in this case, at least two initial terms. So if I told you A1 and A2, you could tell me A3. So we'll go with A1 is 0 and A2 is 1. So I'm going to. So we were given, we were given this information right here. So we're given all this. We want to find, let's go with a 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So a3, just looking at the formula here, is going to be a2 plus a1. Here is where I needed to know the actual values of a2 and a1. So I just add a2 and a1 together. So a2 is 1 plus 0 is 1. So this, go ahead and find a4, 5, 6, and 7. So same thing, a4 is a3 plus a2. And you have all those numbers. So go ahead and get a4, a5, a6, and a7. So you should have gotten 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. Still nobody knows the sequence? Fibonacci. Fibonacci sequence. It's Italian, so F-I-B. Anachi, however you spell that. I think it's... Is that right? Fibonacci? I don't know. All right, so that's Fibonacci sequence. Uh, there are some useful properties of it. Uh, I just used it for 
uh, recursive, we're talking about a recursively defined sequence. We're not going to do uh, much at all with recursive sequences, just want you to be aware of them. So I don't even think I have a homework problem on recursive sequences. So they are not going to be on any quiz or midterms. Well, I guess at this point, final. So we're running out of time in the quarter. So this is the point where due dates are not so far into the future because everything really needs to be due by the final exam. Well, uh, I like to have everything due a couple days before the final exam, so I just want to warn you, homework dates will start to not be very far into the future. So it's a really bad time to fall behind. Plus, on your final exam, you have to know everything, not just sequences and series. So about a third of your final sequences and series, and then two thirds of it, it's all the other stuff put together. So you're not allowed to forget all that. So you don't want to be doing your sequence and series homework the night before your final exam. You want to be doing a little bit of everything the night before your final exam. We're going to go with a bunch of definitions now. I'm not going to hold re you responsible for these definitions. What we will generally be doing is talking about is this sequence convergent or divergent? If it's convergent, what does it converge to? So those are the types of questions I'm going to ask you from 10.1. So basically, convergent or not, and if it converges, to what number? So our definitions, let's go bounded from above. So these are uh, all about a sequence. An. So an is bounded from above if there exists a number n, a real number n. And have I done the backwards e yet for there exists? No? All right, time to write that down too. So backwards e means there exists. So this is bounded from above. If there exists an n, a real number n, such that a n is less than big N for all n. So that means there's some big number n that all the sequences, all the terms are less than that big number. That's what bounded from above means. And when I, I'm just going to write all n, and what I mean by all n is all n, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, et cetera. So when I just say all n, I mean all n that makes sense for that sequence. So generally we mean positive integers. Sometimes we start at zero. So I'm just going to write all n. which means generally n is going to be in the positive integers is usually how we, uh, usually the values that we're going to use for our indexes. So that's bounded from above. What's next? Bounded from below. So very similar. If there exists, let's go with a uh, big M. If there's a real number M such that, and here we want the analogous bound, but instead of everything being less than N, we want all of them to be greater than M. And this is for all N. So we have some small number that is less than every term in our sequence. So there's bounded from above, bounded from below, and we'll go bounded. So this is just bounded. So an is bounded 
if it is bounded from below and above. So bounded is actually stronger, it means bounded both sides. So let's really quickly look at some of our sequences. So here's the Fibonacci sequence. We only went up to the seventh term. I think we can see it's definitely bounded from below. What number could you pick so that bounded from below would be true? What would M be? What small number is every term going to be bigger than? Negative one. Negative one. Uh, if I let it to be greater than or equal to, I could have chosen zero. But either way, there's numbers that every term is going to be bigger than. So definitely bounded from below. Does it look like Fibonacci is bounded from above? You basically keep adding more and more each term. And so no matter what number you pick, even if you picked a trillion, we can go out far enough and find numbers bigger than the number you picked. So Fibonacci will be bounded from below, but definitely not above. And if I scroll up, there's plenty of other. Let's see. Did a few at the beginning. All right, let's do All right, this second example, 2, 4, 12, 48, 240, bounded from below? Yes. Definitely. You can choose You actually can choose 1. You can choose any number that's less than 2. So I think 1 would be the natural choice. Could choose -400 if you really wanted to. Um, but you generally want to pick the best bound that you can the closest bound. Uh, what about this geometric series, 1 9th, 1 27th, 1 81st? Bounded on both sides. So what will be the upper bound? Give me a big number that every term is less than. Definitely going to be less than 1. We could get a little bit better. Whatever number, I can pick on any number a little bit bigger than 1 9th. So two ninths or an eighth, something like that. Uh, what about bounded from below? What number c would I have to choose? Zero. 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 You can't choose a positive number because eventually I will get smaller than that positive number. Uh, we can go through any of these here. I think this next example, this alternating sign, Looks like the biggest you're going to be is negative, uh, positive 5 and negative 20. So those would be the largest and smallest terms right there. And they just get closer to 0 after that. So there is bounded. And now we're going to look at increasing, decreasing. So these are monotonically. So we'll go with monotonically increasing first. Monotonically is a scary word that just means strictly. Strictly meaning, in this case, increasing, they're getting bigger, but they're never going to actually stay the same size. So each term is bigger than the one before and not equal. So this will be mono monotonically increasing if a n greater than a n minus 1. So your nth term is bigger than your previous, your n minus 1 term, and this should be for all n. So not just for some of the terms, but for all the terms. They're going to be increasing. And uh, decreasing is exactly the same except we change our inequality. So mon ooh. Should be decreasing. Decreasing if 
a n less than a n minus one. And this is also for all n. So if we took out the word monotonic here, it would be okay for them to be equal to the term following them. So they wouldn't have to get bigger, they could uh, stay the same size. So let's put some of these together. So this is the end of our definitions. So let's make some theorems. If an is monotonically increasing and bounded from above. So you have a sequence that is getting bigger, but there's a number that is never going to go past. We can make a conclusion about the convergence or divergence of this sequence. So terms are getting bigger, but they can't go past a certain value. So we can say this converges. So then an converges. You can use this to justify convergence or divergence, but you're going to need to tell me that it is the sequence is increasing and bounded above. And then you can conclude that it converges. Probably not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but you could use these theorems if you wanted to. And we could also go the other way if an is decreasing, uh, monotonically decreasing, and bounded from below. Then an converges. Now there are some other versions I could write down if you're monotonic tonically increasing and you're definitely not bounded from above, you would uh, increase forever and, not, and be divergent. Uh, but showing something's not bounded from above is basically the same math that would be involved with, uh, if you want, want to show it's not bounded from above, you're basically showing me it diverges. So on your way to showing that, you would have already shown that it diverges. So you don't need to directly remember these theorems right here. You can basically find convergence divergence with a regular limit. So that is 10.1. So I definitely need to post your homeworks. And we'll go to 10.2 now. So this is series. So we'll start with definition. So a series is the sum of a sequence. So sequences, series are super similar. The only difference is series, you add up all the terms in your sequence. So this only really becomes challenging for infinite. If you have an infinite uh, sequence and you want to know what the sum is. So that is where we'll spend most of our time, is adding up an infinite number of terms and figuring out when does that give us a number and when does it not. So if you want your series Series, uh, let's call it uh, S, is going to equal A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus 
dot 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 plus a n we'll go with the big n here there's two types and the second one a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 so the first one is a finite no first one yeah first one's a finite series and the second one is infinite we need to start using summation notation. So that is going to look like a capital sigma. You need to pick, we'll go with a AI. I equals one. I think your book goes K's. So let's start, let's use K's. A K, K equals one to big N. And the second one is summation k equals 1 to infinity of a k. So summation, all that means is add up from starting at 1 or whatever number you've written at the bottom and go up to either whatever number's at the top or infinity. So that is what summation notation looks like. This finite series, also known as a partial sum. So a partial sum is where you add up some of the terms, so a finite amount of terms. So let's say adding the first n terms. of an infinite sequence. So partial sums can be very useful. So if your entire series was summation k equals 1 to uh, infinity a k, so if this was your infinite series, Your partial sum we're going to use s sub n is summation k equals 1 to n a k. So you're going to add up the first 50 terms, the first 100 terms, first 1,000 terms, and that will be a partial sum. So how do we relate the full sum S to the partial sum Sn? How can we relate the two? Limit. Oh yeah, so we're going to do a limit. So what do you want to do? You look at the partial sum, if you have a nice formula for it, you just keep making N bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you actually can take the limit, that you can get the full infinite sum that way. So we have lim big N approaches infinity Sn equals S. So if you have a nice partial sum that you can take a limit, you can figure out your full sum. It's not always possible to get a partial sum formula that's nice. Sometimes you just can't do it. For example, I don't, I'm not aware of Fibonacci, uh, adding up the first n terms of the Fibonacci sequence. I don't know that there is necessarily a good form for that. But there are some times where it is very useful. So let's start out with the geometric series sum. <coughs> So we saw the geometric sequence is r raised to increasing powers. So geometric series is really similar, except it's a series. So it looks like summation r to the n power. Or we'll go k, instead we're going to use k's. So we'll go r to the k power 
Now this one, if you started at zero, the form looks a little bit nicer. This is going to be one over one minus r, if r is small. So the absolute value of r is less than one. So why do we need r to be small? What happens if, if r equals positive one? What happens if you add up an infinite number of ones? One plus one plus one plus one plus 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 infinity. The other problem, one's certainly not going to work as a nice denominator over here. Uh, so this only works for small r's. And if your r is big, like two, yeah, I could plug in one over one minus two, but two raised to increasing powers is going to get to infinity very quickly. Well, I should say it will move very quickly towards infinity. So. That's why you need a small r for this to work. So I think we have time to talk about why this works. So we are going to multiply. Now let's, let's write out the partial. Let's derive the partial sum and then take a limit. So we're going to look and see where this actually comes from. So we're going to multiply 1 minus r times 1 plus r plus r squared plus r to the, let's go n power. So I want you right now to multiply this out. You can do it. Don't be afraid. Actually, let me write the last, not just the last term. I'm going to write the last two terms. So go ahead and multiply this out and simplify it down. And when you multiply it out, distribute it in this way. So 1 minus r plus r minus r squared. So distribute it out like this. So take the 1 minus r and then multiply it to the first term, multiply it to the second term, multiply it to the third term, then go dot, 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 second to last term plus last term. So multiply it out, and the form should look like this. So any questions getting to this? So we're okay with this right here. What can I start canceling out? What's the first thing you see that I can cancel out? So I can cancel out r with the minus r right next to it. So those cancel out. What else cancels? 
r squared. What would r cubed cancel with? The very next term, if I would have went one more, and would have canceled there. So I'm just going to go circle with what would come next. All right, what about on the other side? Does Rn plus r to the n plus 1 cancel with anything? The very last. What about Rn? Yep, Rn minus Rn cancels. And then Rn minus r to the n minus 1 will cancel with a previous term. So basically, every inside term canceled, and I'm left with first and last. So just rewriting all this. So I just rewrote everything, simplifying the right side to what we just agreed to. And then I just rewrote the left side as 1 minus r times summation, which is all these increasing powers of r added together. And I did have to start at 0, so I could have the initial uh, a0. I need 1 as my first term. So summation notation is going to be weird at first. That's OK. You'll get used to it probably in a day or two, depending on how much homework you do, how quickly. So summation notation, it's not scary. It's just all this added together. We just read it as summation. So now I'm going to solve for the summation by dividing by 1 minus r. So we have summation k equals 0 to n r to the k equals 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. We can call this Sn. So that's the nth partial sum. Anybody other textbook with them? I want to get, I think, I think this is the form they have in the book, but I just want to be sure that we get it uh, just like the book. What we're going to do now. S equals lim n approaches infinity, Sn equals lim n approaches infinity, 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Just this a over 1 minus r. A over, that's for the infinite one? Do they have a, a oh, oh. Uh, going to the, it probably, it may use capital N or. It should be in the book. It should be somewhere in 10 to. All right, this limit, n approaches infinity, r is not changing. So what happens if r absolute value is less than 1? What happens to this term that I circled? A small number raised to an increasing power. So think about a number like a half. You keep raising it to higher and higher powers. That number is going to get smaller and smaller. So as long as r is not big, this term is going to go to 0. And that's the only n inside this limit. So that's the only term it's going to change. So we're going to get 1 minus 0 over 1 minus r, which is 1 over 1 minus r. And that is exactly where the geometric series formula comes from. So there's the infinite form, and here is the partial sum or the finite form right here.
So let's go ahead and use this to find some sums. First one So the first task we have is get a formula for the nth term. Good news is I think we did this one already. So I can write as summation a n. I just need to figure out what is, or we'll go a k. So what pattern is happening? Multiply by a third. Yeah, multiply by a third. So if we do this one third to the k power, what does k have to start at? Two. So that should work for starting at two, you get a ninth. 3, you get 127th, 4, you get 181st. So these are equal. What is not good about actually finding the sum with this form? It does go to infinity, but our r is small. It's less than 1. So our is we will be able to use this formula eventually. Why can I not use it right away? What is wrong with, what's different about our series? We almost have it in exactly the right form. What's our problem? K needs to start at zero. So I need to address that. So there are two ways to go about it. We can do a change the index is one way, which is generally, I think, the easier way. So I'm going to deal with this in a multiplicative way. So I'm going to shift. I'm just going to take k and drop it down 2. Now if I drop k down by 2, I have to do that everywhere. So I got 1 third to the ooh, k plus 2. So we'll start at 0, but I really want that to be 1 third squared. And then my one term will be 1 third cubed. My two term will be the 1, uh, one third to the fourth power, which is 181st. So any questions on that changing? Uh, I shifted the index down to, so I compensated by so I started at 0, and I compensated by doing the plus 2. So I dropped it by 2, and I had to compensate or increase it by 2 right here. Unfortunately, this is not quite ready for geometric series form right here. What is different about geometric series compared to what we have? Now our power got messed up. We're starting at 0, but I don't just have 1 third to the k power. So I want to get it in this geometric series form right here. Summation starting at 0, a small number, in our case 1 third to the k power. But I'm starting, uh, I have k plus 2. So algebraically, this is an easy problem to fix. We'll go one third squared, one third to the k. So I just took out or factored out one third squared. And then you just add the powers together and you got k plus two.
So we are almost there. The very last thing I'm going to do is factor out 1 3rd squared, which is a ninth. Now we just have one third to the k power. And finally, we're ready to apply the geometric sum formula. We have one over one minus one third, which is one over two thirds. Multiply by reciprocal. One ninth times three halves, which is one sixth. And that is our infinite sum of this geometric series. So we added up an infinite number of numbers, and using this cool cancellation property plus a limit, we're able to add up an infinite number of numbers and get one sixth. Right now you should be thinking, neat. So some of you are probably worried about some of the algebra that I just did right there. So let's talk about some algebra on uh, summation notation. So this is all algebra you've done before, a lot of times before. What can I do? So if you have summation of a number times a n, what algebra can I do with this number C? Factor it out. So this equals C times A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus dot, dot, dot. So this will be C times summation AN. So this is factoring. So summarize these up here. So sum C times sum A N is summation C times A N. So there is factoring. That, I think, is the only one that is guaranteed to work. So I don't think there's any others that always work. This one does sometimes work, however. So this was all factoring. So this one won't always work. So wouldn't it be nice if you add up a n plus b n a whole bunch of times? So you can just add up all the a's, add up all the b's, take those two sums, add them together. So when will this work? It will work when all three pieces converge. So this works when all three pieces converge. Meaning none of them are infinity or negative infinity.
So none are plus or minus infinity or divergent in some other way. So this is called reordering. And it only works when the series converges. Now I haven't told you what it means for a series to converge. All it means is you just add it up, and if you don't get a number, it doesn't converge. So infinity, negative infinity are two common ones. Uh, another one that won't converge is, uh, we'll look at this later, but negative 1 to the nth power. You add up negative 1 plus positive 1 plus negative 1 plus positive 1, go on forever, you never settle down to a number. So we'll look at that as well. If it's a finite summation, do you have to worry about that? No. Okay. Finite summations always add up to a number. Right.